thank you for joining us on this webinar today to talk about this important topic. Just a quick reminder, we have the pre-reading and case study materials for available in the download handouts column. And we will be incorporating polling questions throughout this webinar to discuss the content and apply that information that we're learning and that we're talking about in the case study scenario. Thank you again for coming. I'm joined today by Dr. Noel Bush Armendariz, and my name is Caitlin Sully. We are a part of the Institute on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault at the University of Texas at Austin in the School of Social Work. And our mission is to advance knowledge about interpersonal violence through research, education, and service in multidisciplinary strategic partnerships with researchers, educators, practitioners, policymakers, and other members of our community. Our vision is for our efforts to enhance the quality and relevance of research findings, their application and service provision, and ultimately their benefit to survivors of interpersonal violence and those who assist them. One more piece about IDVSA. We approach our work from a multidisciplinary focus, and so the members of the institute include the School of Social Work, the School of Law, the School of Nursing, and the Bureau for Business Research. And we're all in, actively engaged in, in our And I realize that we have two final questions that we'd like to ask our participants. And those are to, figure, to see who we have in the room with us today. So we're pulling up two more questions right now. The first one is, what category best describes your discipline? And we've included five different answers, and you can answer other if these do not adequately describe your discipline. Attorneys and prosecutors, law enforcement, victim service providers in the criminal justice context, advocates in the community-based context, SANES or medical professionals, and other. And we'll advance to our last question. How many people are taking this webinar with you? We have four options. This is not applicable. I'm taking this webinar on my own. I'm taking this with one other person, which is option B. I'm taking this with two other people, option three. Or I'm taking this with more than three people, option D. Thank you for responding to those questions. So how did we come to this presentation today? Starting in 2011, we worked with the multidisciplinary team in Houston to conduct research on untested sexual assault kits. The project was funded by the National Institute of Justice, and our role at IDVSA was specifically to conduct research about victims' experiences with untested sexual assault kits and to learn more about the victim notification practice development and implementation. And this was done, of course, in collaboration with partners from Houston, including the crime lab, the police department, prosecution, community-based advocates, and sexual assault nurse examiners. As a result of a proposal to translate victim notification research findings to practice, we received funding through the Office on Violence Against Women to provide training and technical assistance. Thank you to OVW for their support on addressing this critical aspect of response to survivors of sexual assault. As a part of this training and technical assistance project, we're offering a six-part webinar series in 2016, conference presentations. We will also have a victim notification guide published this fall and available publicly. And we're providing technical assistance, which is free and available to anyone undertaking victim notification in your community. And this is for any discipline, and you can reach out to me via email or my office line, which is on this slide here. The objectives for today's webinar, our first webinar, are for you to come away with increased knowledge about victim-centered practice, an improved understanding of the victim notification research, and increased ability to apply the tenets of procedural justice theory to notification. Across the United States, focus and attention has been put on untested sexual assault kits, 
In some communities, the sexual assault kits have been discovered. Um, most commonly, the sexual assault kits have been stored in police department property rooms, and it wasn't historically common to test every single sexual assault kit. This practice has come to change over time. Some sexual assault kits may actually have been submitted, but had been sitting at crime labs waiting to be tested. And further, in some cases, sexual assault kits that were collected may have been destroyed. And leading us in this field has been the National Institute of Justice, which has contributed to the examination of this issue and has funded projects to shed light on this issue. To start, we want to share some terms that we'll use throughout the webinar. All of these terms are in reference to cases that were reported to law enforcement. So we'll use the term untested, which is when a SAC has not been subjected to forensic analysis. Unsubmitted or unrequested, when a SAC has never been requested for testing, most often stored in a property room. Backlogged, this is when a SAC has not been tested within 30 days after being submitted to a crime lab. The terms victim, survivor, or complainant refer to any individual who has been sexually assaulted. And in this webinar, we're going to use some of the terms interchangeably, but most often we'll use victim uh, because the project is grounded in the criminal justice system and it recognizes that a crime has been reported to law enforcement and affords that survivor their specific rights in the criminal justice system. We have two more. The victim-centered approach, which NIJ defined very nicely in the pre-reading material, which is when the victim is at the center of all decisions regarding recovery and any involvement with the criminal justice system. The victim's choice, safety, and well-being is the focus, and the needs of the victim are everyone's concern. And trauma-informed, which is to attend to the victim's emotional and physical safety, using resources, services, and support to increase the victim's capacity to recover and educating victims, service providers, and the general community about the impact of sexual assault trauma on the health of the victim. So how did we get to this point? It's helpful to start with the practices, reasons, and decisions made around testing or not testing sexual assault kits. And we know that there's a variety of factors, including decisions to test were made with regard to case circumstances. In some sexual assault cases, there were other evidence that resulted in an arrest and the charge of an offender, for example, and so the SAC was not tested. Another example could be when the testing decision was made by a prosecutor who may have deemed that there wasn't enough evidence to move forward with prosecution. Um, also, at times, jurisdictions may have waited to test the sexual assault kit until a suspect was developed and didn't test for identification, but for comparison. A related factor is the forensic science technology has developed and, become, and has become increasingly sensitive over time, and the FBI's combined DNA index system, or CODIS, has been used more widely over time, and the practices around testing and the use of CODIS have had to catch up to these developments. Third, misinformation and bias around sexual assault trauma have historically persisted and have resulted in negative attitudes and disbelief around victim credibility, which can have an effect on testing decisions for their sexual assault evidence. And lastly, resources. Some cases may have been prioritized over others for testing. There may have been a lack of resources to send sexual assault kits to a crime lab for testing, and we know at times for some communities it was prohibitively expensive to test all sexual assault kits. These factors resulted in a large number of untested facts across the country and now have led us to our current efforts around five primary activities, inventorying, testing, notification, investigation, and prosecution. So when jurisdictions now begin to inventory and test all of their sex that they have in their property room, the downstream effect can occur. And in some communities, it can feel like the floodgates are opening. It's not simply a matter of getting the kit tested, but then requires all of the other activities to be initiated, like assigning cases to investigators, 
meeting as a community to discuss what to do in response to the untested sexual assault kits, reviewing prior case records, locating and notifying victims, engaging them in the process and explaining next steps, conducting further investigation, consulting with the prosecutor, filing charges, and potentially prosecuting the offender for the crime. So we're just going to focus in this webinar series on one piece, the notification piece. And we're going to build on these ideas over the next six months and break it down so that we avoid mm -hmm. this feeling of the floodgates opening. So what do we know about some of the immediate first questions you may have, be having about contacting and notifying victims about their forensic results? How do we locate victims, firstly? What resources are available to us to do this? Does the victim still live in our community? What do we do if they have relocated out of state or out of the country? And from research, we know that victims can be difficult to locate in some communities. And the ability to locate them can depend on the area and its history. For example, its industry and the migration to and from that area over time. What's the impact, secondly, of the passage of time? A case may not be able to move forward because the statute of limitations expired, and therefore does the victim still need to be notified? Is the victim or the suspect deceased? Or if located, will the victim still be interested in participating? From some victims, we've heard that they have moved on since the initial report. Third, to what degree will the contact be re-victimizing or re-traumatizing? What do we know about approaching victims? The contact with a criminal justice representative can be re-triggering, and it can make the victim think of the assault and elicit traumatic symptoms. We've seen this from the research in Houston and Detroit. The survivor may express frustration and anger, and we, have, we must consider that the response may be affected by the victim's prior treatment in the criminal justice system or their history with law enforcement. Another question, what's the structure that should be developed for notification in this community? How do we go about developing this protocol? What guidelines should we use? From research, we know that a multidisciplinary response is required, and multiple professional perspectives con should contribute to this dialogue. Five, which contact methods should be used? Should we start with a phone call, or should we go with a home visit first? From research, we see that phone calls to set up an in-person meeting, and then having those in-person meetings investigator and with an advocate can help to create a situ situation that better engages a victim and is a better conduit for providing information to those victims. Next, which professionals should be tasked with providing this information? Depending on your approach, is it police or is it prosecutor's detective? are advocates included in the, in the process. And we know from research with victims that they did want advocates to be involved, but that all professionals should be skilled at compassionate and flexible responses to victims. And number seven, what information should be provided upon contact? Depending on the contact method, information could include the results of the forensic testing and anything that will be helpful to the victim about their options moving forward, although we know specifically that victims should not be asked to make a decision about the participation in prosecution at that initial contact. So I'm going to invite Noelle to review some of the case study details and we'll launch into a polling question. Okay, hi everybody. So we, as a uh, pre-reading, gave you a case so we can try to apply some of the um, philosophies and underpinnings of what we've learned. So I just want to review a couple of case details, and then we're going to do another polling question in just a minute. So this case is about Gina, and she was sexually assaulted by Mike in his car in 2001. Um, she does go for um, a forensic exam and, and reports to the police, but at that time can't recall too many details. She experiences trauma symptoms, which are described in the case, um, and those symptoms and the sexual assault really affect her life and her ability to participate in the investigation in 2001. 
An investigator and a victim service provider contact Gina to provide community resource information. Then 13 years later, um, her, her kid is tested and an uh, investigator calls her to give her new information. So we're going to move to our polling question about this. And then we're going to see how we can apply it. So polling question one. In this case study, Gina received a call from the investigator in 2014. In your opinion, what is the most critical issue to consider as the investigator prepares to provide information and potentially move Gina's case forward? Uh, a, Gina's ability to recall details about the sexual assault. B, uh, uh, building a relationship. C, history of the case details of 2001. D, understanding about the impact of passage of, of the time. E, impact of trauma. F, ability to provide answers to questions that Gina might ask. And G, need for community services. Now, I'm a teacher by trade and probably would not give that many uh, uh, options. Um, students would freak out a little bit. Okay, so we're going to wait a minute, let everybody poll in. Okay, it looks like most people have made answers um, if you're making them. Oops, some more coming in. Okay, so what we want to really emphasize here is, uh, and the reason we had such a long list, is because here there's really no right answer. Although there may be better answers than others, most of you said, 65% of you said, impact of trauma. Um, so it's an interesting thing to think about. What we know is that um, cases have to be handled both uh, with regard to their individual aspects and with broad knowledge about how trauma could in, uh, impact uh, an individual. So thanks for asking that question. What we think is that there's no wrong answer in that list. There are some better answers, and certainly understanding trauma um, and its impact is one of them. So back over to Caitlin. So moving forward, as jurisdictions seek to address their untested sex sexual assault kits and conduct this notification, we're confronted with this risk of re-traumatization. So we want to cover a little bit of the research on the forms of victimization. Firstly, the nature of sexual assault trauma makes it difficult to report. Sexual assault memories are less clear, not well remembered, and typically not in chronological order. They are also infrequently talked about and less likely to be recalled voluntarily, even if the survivor wants to, or involuntarily. The elevated or continuous stress from the sexual assault can interfere with the victim's ability to co constructively cope with the experience and take the necessary steps to recover and heal or to participate in a sexual assault investigation. Secondly, victims can experience secondary victimization um, during their engagement with criminal justice professionals. Victims enter the criminal justice process with their own ideas about the complex about the criminal justice system, and this can include misinformation due to the complexities of the system. They also may have difficulty participating in the process due to lack of time, energy, and resources. It requires both emotional and financial resources. As you know, the system itself is complex, and it has a variety of functions and goals. And we know much more about survivors' reactions and the way that trauma works and how it affects survivors than we historically have in the past, which contributes to this idea of secondary victimization by the system. And thirdly, there's a form of tertiary victimization, which is when it's defined as when society as a whole is victimized by the absence or presence of something. Um, so we could propose that tertiary victimization includes the issue of returning to forensic evidence, testing it years after initial report, and then reintroducing this information to victims often years after that initial report. Victims may have had the expectation if they had submitted to this difficult and invasive forensic exam, even if it had the most compassionate, high-quality care, they would think that that evidence would be used in a timely manner at the time of initial report. 
can I go back to the polling question? I just want to read something that Nancy put up on the board. Um, so she said, so they're from the Rain Rape Crisis, Crisis Rape Crisis Center. I hope I said that right. Um, and what they, what she says that they use as good practice is asking the survivor to keep them informed of the status and being very gentle in their approach. Um, and then you go on to say, Nancy, um, trauma and the impact of time, um, but you also need to establish a relationship. And I think you're exactly right. Um, you know, we asked you to, we gave you a forced choice uh, in that polling question, but I think all of understanding the complexity of both the crime and its impact requires us really to do all of these things. So thanks for both of those comments. So in addition to these forms of victimization that we talk about, primary, secondary, and tertiary, that affect victims' experiences, I also want to point out that in future webinars and in our um, victim notification guide that we'll release in the fall, we'd like to bring up the dialogue around the strain that professionals may experience who are working on addressing untested sexual assault kits and conducting this notification and how important it is to build that resiliency around this issue, um, not only when we think about the survivors, but also for the professionals, their teams, those organizations, and the communities that are engaging around this issue. So we know that notification poses many risks, but it's also an opportunity for re-engagement, which can lead to positive things, including validation of a victim's experience, empowering that victim with choice and control in the process. We know that information for victims can lead to healing, potentially, or feelings of safety. For example, if the victim is told that the offender in their case is deceased or incarcerated, even just knowing those results and that they're matched to someone who already is incarcerated or perhaps not living anymore can lead to feelings of validation and safety and that someone believe that survivor. It can also lead to provision of justice, offender accountability, and crime prevention. So two sources of what we know and where we're going based on research comes from the research done in Houston, Texas, and Wayne County, Michigan, or Detroit. Organizations in these two cities received funding in 2011 to conduct action research over three to four years on their sexual assault kits. And this evidence is just emerging, so there are many practices out there that, that may have work that we're not going to talk about. So if you work somewhere or know others who have done this work, please feel free to share that information with us so we can can build upon those lessons that we've learned throughout the country and share those as we undertake this work together. But these two cities approach the issue of victim notification, and the research outcomes provide insight into what's worked and what's been a challenge. Um, and this work, again, was done by multidisciplinary groups that included researchers. Um, the findings point to various components of the process as well. So how was the notification protocol developed and then implemented? What did that process look like? What were its outcomes? And what did the groups in each city learn? Um, we had many, many discussions in Houston. So pictured here are notes from one of our working sessions around the process for developing the victim notification response. And I would say that um, this was one of many. Um, and this is what our process looked like in terms of uh, as the multidisciplinary team tried to make decisions about what these data told us and how we should develop our notification process. And so those uh, communities that are considering um, developing a notification process should, should stick with the process as they say, um, because you won't get it in the first or the second or the third try, perhaps. Um, you'll have to engage just like you did uh, or with the victims, um, also with each other, um, and trust their opinions and listen deeply for how to develop it so that it is culturally grounded for your community. And I'd just like to, to put in a note of caution that we're not going to compare between the two cities. They're very different cities in terms of the population and resources. Um, I'll note that Houston's lead partner was the police department and their crime lab, and Detroit's lead was 
attorney's office, Morley's office. Houston is a large southern city, the third largest in the country, and Detroit, a midwestern city that by comparison is under-resourced. So how did we set out to learn about the creation of these victim notification strategies? Did victims even want information? What was the best way to approach them, sometimes 30 years after they originally reported a sexual assault? What's the most ethical and sensitive way to provide this information? So we conducted in-depth interviews and focus groups with 42 survivors and 27 professionals, and we learned that giving victims the opportunity for choice and control in the process was one of the primary recommendations that the notification should also be flexible and thoughtful. Victims wanted information about their case if it could move forward, and that they also had the right to know. There would also be unintended consequences to notification, and that phone and in-person contact was preferred, whereas letters were seen as impersonal, and advocacy was critical in the process. So in Houston, the findings from these data collection served as a guide for the notification practices and their development. So Houston created a step-by-step -step notification procedure that's available online once the sexual assault kit analysis was complete. And the protocol aimed to use victim-centered and trauma-informed approach by standardizing thoughtful and sensitive responses to victims. Its primary goal was to increase victims' comfort and engagement with the criminal justice system and minimize risk for re-traumatization. Generally, victims were notified if there was a CODIS hit or if there was another piece of evidence after investigative review that could move that case forward, and the justice advocate was also part of the notification process. So police investigators and sometimes the justice advocate contacted victims initially scheduled an in-person meeting, and shared new information about their case with them. Survivors also had the choice of contacting the sexual assault information line or email, which was promoted throughout the community, and it was answered by a trained crisis service provider. So what I'll say is before we develop this uh, notification um, protocol is uh, we vetted uh, what, what would lead to unintended negative consequences for victims. Um, and that really drove the process. It was over a series of meetings and actions and people in the multidisciplinary group having a voice about uh, their opinions. We really had to listen to what would happen for the prosecution, what would happen for the investigation, what would happen for the victim. And so those voices in the development, your own development or uh, applying something like ours, is important for you to vet both what is um, intended and unintended of those consequences before you implement. And then, of course, it's always good to review how is it going and do, does the protocol itself need to be tweaked a bit. So similarly, Detroit had a multidisciplinary team that met for a two-day retreat to create their protocol. Um, and they created a protocol, and they've provided this wonderful figure so we can visualize what that notification looked like. They also decided to actively notify victims when either a DNA profile or a CODIS hit, or CODIS profile but no hit resulted from the testing of the forensic evidence. Um, Survivors who didn't receive active outreach could also opt in to notification by contacting the project themselves. And they established a multidisciplinary notification review team to make decisions about cases, specifically those approaching the statute of limitations for those cases. Their goals for the first contact were to explain that the kit had not been tested at the time of the report, but now had been tested offered an apology in cases to the survivors, offered a follow-up meeting, and this first contact was done by investigators from the prosecutor's office, normally at the survivor's home, but sometimes over the phone. The goals for the second meeting were to provide more detailed information, discuss options, connect survivor to resources, and that usually happened with both the prosecutor's detective and an advocate. 
So of the 41 cases selected for this process, victims in 31 cases could be located at the time the research was concluded. So first let's look at some of these outcomes for notification. In Houston, a small sample of victims were interviewed who had been notified using the Houston protocol. And we learned from them that victims did not regret being recontacted. They wanted to hear about their cases. They appreciated the, the role and the service provided to them by the advocate. There were positive aspects to being contacted at a later date for them. For some people, they described themselves as more mature and better able to handle and process the trauma and the, the trauma that was occurring to them now as a result of this new information. They appreciated the choice and opportunity to participate in the case moving forward. They appreciated the sense of compassionate and flexible treatment that they received from the investigators, from the CODIS squad investigators who shared this new information with them. But there were also challenges. Um, many were triggered from the, this time lapse. How come they waited so long to test my sexual assault kit, and now I'm being refaced with this trauma? It was very triggering. Um, we saw a, a myriad of emotional reactions, frustranger, anger, but also appreciation for the information. Many people had barriers in their current lives that made it difficult to engage, and many people had uncertainty and moral dilemma. It was difficult for survivors to participate in the investigation, but they felt that it was they had to because they didn't want this crime to happen to someone else if they didn't. In Detroit, investigators reported about their notification experiences with victims. And we learned that victims could be located without tremendous investigative effort in this community. With regard to their emotional reaction, there were, again, a myriad of reactions. Strong negative emotional reactions, strong positive emotional reactions, and for some, neither strong nor positive emotional reactions. And they were also able to specify factors that predicted further participation in the criminal justice system. Victims who had a strong negative emotional reaction were least likely to re-engage than those who had a strong or neither type of reaction. The longer the time between the assault and the testing, the less likely the victim would want to continue with the investigation. And those who were assaulted between the ages of 16 and 24 were less likely to be willing to continue contact. And those who knew their attacker were also less likely to want to participate. And now I'm going to hand it back over to Noel for our second polling question. And I'm just going to answer a question. I put it up on the um, Q&A um, by Adriana, who asked how many victims were involved in that group that led to, um, that, that were notified, and then we asked them about their notification process. There were eight, I think. Um, and the reason for the small number is uh, we gave victims the choice or, or not to invo be involved in the research. Caitlin's giving me, there were seven. Caitlin always gives me the right answer. Um, so there were seven involved. So it was a very, very small number. Um, although um, research shows that if you have a relatively homogeneous group, you can uh, build some theory around what they have said. So thanks for that question. Um, so polling question number two, here it is. Um, so this is really about you. Um, and we want to, to know how, how the first thing you would want to do. So based on the research that you've heard now about victim notification and a protocol, what would you consider to be the most important step to prepare for Gina's potential reactions to the new evidence? Would you first want to be aware and think through how you build a trusting relationship and that it's a process? Would you want to know more about looking for the signs of trauma? Um, and understanding that it can look a, a very, very different ways for uh, victims. Would you want to know that there's never right, one right answer and being comfortable with knowing that uh, the key um, to helping a survivor is being empathetic and non-judgmental? Or um, would you have to practice saying, I don't know, but how can I help? 
And the reason we put that last one in there is really because um, I don't know, but how can I help? We found that there, there were there were lots and lots of cases in Houston that we could we knew we couldn't move forward on, so that we had to start thinking as a multidisciplinary team that justice might be served for these victims in ways that didn't look like prosecution. Although it, any case that that provided evidence where it could be prosecuted went forward, the vast majority of them. Uh, at least at the end of the project, we knew weren't going forward. And so a lot of times we had to say um, we had to have investigators get in touch with the ability to say, I don't know, how can we help otherwise? And that actually did a lot for the three things listed above. So thanks for that polling question. I would agree that um, empathetic and non-judgmental are absolutely keys, but of course, and that's what 89% of you said. Um, but really, uh, none of these are wrong answers again. So now we know that there have been remarkable efforts across the US to respond to untested facts and to conduct notification. And I'm going to go very quickly through the next few slides. And you have these slides available to you in your download handouts tab. So you can review them later. Um, but there have Coal case units in the U.S. have been working on this type of issue for Those units look different. Their roles and functions differ by community. Um, and there are many of those who have some stellar practices that we'd like to, to highlight. Um, some of those communities are Phoenix, Denver, and Dallas. And we know now that there is a, a new cohort of communities that are working to address their untested sexual assault kits. Um, so I want to acknowledge the efforts of the grantees from the BJA SAC initiative and the District Attorney in New York initiative. I'm going to go quickly through these next few. But they'll be available on the website. Mm -hmm. And I also just wanted to point out that what you already know, there are laws regarding sexual assault kits that vary by state, and they can have a, an impact on victim notification practices. And we'll cover these more in later webinars, and I'm happy to answer technical assistance questions on, on these in the meantime if you'd like to contact me. Um, some states um, require mandatory submission of sexual assault kits to labs for testing. Uh, many are working to clear their backlogs and have proposed new bills to eliminate these backlogs or untested sexual assault kits. Um, two other important pieces of legislation, the Debbie Smith DNA Backlog Grant Program, which provides federal funding for labs to test backlog SACs and requires states to create plans for reduction for their SAC inventories. Um, and the SAFER Act, which requires 75% of DNA analysis grant funding to be used toward analyzing untested SACs or for increasing lab capacity. And that allows for one-time audits of SACs in law enforcement custody and establishes auditing and reporting processes. Um, and an important point about Debbie Smith Act funding and safer, SAFER plus legislation more broadly is that some programs are for testing these backlog evidence which have not been sent to the lab. So potentially applicants should look closely at the scope of any federal grants that they're applying for to address this issue in their communities. And another important point is on confidentiality for counselors and advocates that are involved in the notification pro process and whether your program that provides these services are VAWA funded, which means that they must meet VAWA confidentiality requirements. And we'd be happy to answer questions about any of these bullets in between now and the next webinar or in later webinars. Please feel free to reach out. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Noelle to talk about what does it take to eliminate untested sexual assault kits, really. OK, so what we really wanted to highlight here are um, what we found to be some fundamentals. Um, in the process that we've been talking about. Um, how can we prevent or re prevent and re the repeated issue? Um, that, that probably needs to be on the board every time you all meet. 
Um, so understanding it, unpacking it in a way, and then thinking about strategies that can prevent it is part of the effort also. Um, we've said this before, but our team was a multidisciplinary team um, with diverse organizational missions, um, and we were all people too, so we all came with our own uh, knowledge and perhaps biases about um, how to address the problem. And so we had to sit through um, deep understanding and learning from each other that sometimes was, was not comfortable, but uh, we joked towards the end of the pro process that um, we felt like we were married in some ways. We were married to the project um, because uh, when you're committed to it, even if you disagree, you come back to re-engage in order to solve um, whatever is before you. Um, and so we've listed here uh, the, the stakeholders that were at our table on a regular basis. We have regular meetings um, that sometimes were organized and sometimes a little disorganized, depending on the data in front of us. Uh, funding is uh, important, both capital funding and financial funding. And so that's one issue um, that I think communities have to uh, talk about. On the website, the Houston Project website, we do have an economic analysis um, so people can start to prepare for perhaps what it's going to cost. And then I think the last thing I want to say really is about um, buy-in is really important. Uh, what leadership says um, about the importance of this issue um, will may, may um, make or break sort of the movement forward um, in addressing um, victim notification. And we also um, had discussions about justice and its different forms and how we can relate, we can use this as we move forward with notification practices. And for justice, the treatment the treatment of the victim can be one form of justice. So um, in the last 13 minutes that we have together, I'd like to share some examples around the procedural justice framework that we'll be using in our notification guide. Justice is concerned with how people are treated during the conflict resolution process and the effect that that treatment on perceptions of justice and fairness has. It asserts that victims of sexual assault stand to benefit from this approach because of the unique nature of their trauma and the risk of revictimization. In a study of psychological effects of secondary victimization and on the quality of legal procedures and quality of outcomes, um, we learned that there are many ways to conceptualize procedural justice with sexual assault victims. So we have created a framework using five of the primary concepts seen in this theory. Representation and voice, which is when a victim is heard and has the opportunity to speak and represent oneself. Accuracy. This means that decisions about the case are made based on accurate information. Neutrality, which is when decisions are made based on consistent rule application. Respect and dignity, which is treating the survivor with respect and dignity, and lastly, fair treatment. The victim's rights are acknowledged and they're treated politely and with courtesy. So researchers conclude that victims of sexual violence require a greater focus on procedural justice as an outlet for pain and trauma because these concepts here, voice, accuracy, neutrality, respect, and dignity, and fair treatment can help counter the negative effects of stigma and sexual assault by providing validation in the aftermath of the crime. So in the victim notification scenario, what exactly does representation and voice look like? So we've come up with some examples of applying this. For representation and voice, this looks like when victims are able to express their frustration with the case and being contacted so long after initial report and being frustrated that the SAC wasn't tested until recently. Accuracy can look like when the professional creates a safe, positive environment and that helps the investigator obtain helpful case information so that investigation can be based on accurate information. Neutrality can look like when the professional contacts the victim despite what the prior sexual assault case documentation said about that victim's 
unwillingness to cooperate in the investigation. Respect and dignity looks like when the professional says to the survivor, your case is important, and listens to that victim's response. And fair treatment can look like when the professional discusses the victim's rights and responds patiently to their questions around those rights. I'll turn it back over to Noelle to do polling question three around procedural justice. Okay, so we wanted to ask you all what your opinions are about procedural justice as we talk about this term. Uh, in, in Gina's case, what, what is the most effective approach to integrating procedural justice concepts in a way that will reintegrate her in the criminal justice process? A, provide Gina with case information after she agrees to participate in prosecution. B, answer Gina's questions about what happened to her forensic evidence and why it yielded uh, these results. And C, ask Gina about her long-term well-being and what she may need to cope and what has worked for her in the past. Okay, so most of you, 70 now, 76% have said B. Um, and both B and C would be right, and I'm glad to see nobody said A, because um, we, under procedural justice, the theory and practice of procedural justice, you wouldn't uh, wait to give case information uh, to a victim after she agrees. Um, you would give that case information beforehand. And what, what we have found, too, is that um, the more uh, in control and information being control, um, the more likely uh, victims will uh, engage or stay engaged. Thanks, Noelle. We wanted to break it down some practice examples in one more way as jurisdictions take on these cases. Um, in some jurisdictions or under different case circumstances, you might be required to notify victims. And we heard that victim, from victims that choice and control was so critical, so we wanted to provide some clear ideas of two different scenarios, one in which the professional is required to notify and one where notification notification is not required based on case circumstances or the protocol in your community. So how does it look when you're required to notify? Again, giving victims information, balancing what they are able to absorb at that moment. Providing victims with choices like time and date and location. Giving them a choice to have a support person present at appropriate times. And when you're not required to, notify. What can choice and control look like in that scenario? Having a dedicated line for victims to call for information, sharing with the community that they can contact the police department to inquire, brochures and a website with FAQs for survivors, conducting community outreach and prevention initiatives to reinforce this messaging holistically. In our future webinars, we will be talking about now the development of victim-centered practices for notification in your community. And we saw from our work in Houston and conducted a survey to look at the successful elements for how to go about planning this process in your community. And we saw that these six elements were common across the process when we surveyed the professionals involved much of which we've talked about today, strategic planning, organizational support, active partnerships, outreach, and a victim-centered approach. So we know there's not a model that's one size fits all, but there's a strategic approach that should be bound by principles of dignity and compassion that can be applied in any jurisdiction. We also know that the inclusion of advocates results in significant positive changes when victims obtain information and referrals and are heard and respected. And victim-centered trauma-informed notification can be a catalyst for providing valuable resources to victims that can benefit investigations and prosecutions and public safety as a whole. I'd like to take just a minute to acknowledge the work of NIJ and Houston and Detroit and OVW, as well as um, thank the participants in today's webinar. And I'd also like to announce that we will have a second webinar on February 25th. The registration is not yet open, but will be soon. 
and we will move from this first webinar's introduction on the issue of victim notification to a presentation by Dr. Rebecca Campbell, who will move us into the science of victim notification with regard to neurobiology. And we'd like to leave with one last polling question about what content would be the most helpful to cover in webinar two. Select A, B, C, or D, or please type in other priorities in the chat box so that we can incorporate those into our planning for webinar two with Dr. Becky Campbell. Our options are A, signs of trauma, B, how the brain functions during trauma and after trauma, C, responding to trauma, or D, changing protocols to be trauma-informed. And I just want to address Nancy's question. Her question is, what's the best approach to find out prior to the contact if a survivor has experienced other traumas, whether it be sexual assault related uh, or in other areas? Um, I, Nancy, it's a great question. Um, I think I know what we can do moving forward for these cases of untested sexual assault kits is a little bit more complicated. Moving forward, I think that um, we found that the same nurse um, and the early, early investigation was key um, because we know that part of what happens for victims is uh, trauma starts to flood after they've reported. And so I think moving forward, changing investigative practices um, is key to understanding that piece. Um, so uh, with uh, untested sexual assault kits, um, I'd love to hear other people's uh, experience or the way you've done this. Um, it would be difficult, unless it was in the case file, to know um, about other traumas. So thanks for that question. And Mike, you asked, will we no be notified by email of upcoming seminars? I'm going to let Can Caitlin answer that because she knows the answer. Yes, we will send upcoming webinar information to all registrants uh, via the email address that they provided. And if you for would like to not continue receiving those emails, please just let me know. Okay, so that is going to conclude our session. I want to thank our speakers for their participation and all of our registrants who attended today's program. Uh, you can register for upcoming live webinars and on-demand recordings of past programs at utaustinsocialworkceu.org. Thanks again, and have a wonderful day.